Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Are you living the dream? Are you living large? Well, I can only imagine that most of you are responding in the affirmative because, after all, you're listening to the Repcolite Home Improvement Show sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And pretty much that means, by definition, that your day is off to a splendid, fantastic start. And really, it's only going to get better and brighter from here because on the show today, I've got all kinds of great stuff planned. But before I tell you what we're going to be talking about, I want to jump right in to the paint point. Because this week, the paint point, you know, the opening segment of the show, the paint point is going to set up the theme for the entire show. All right, here's the deal. I recently made a little visit to our crawl space. You know, big time at my house. I went down to the crawl space. You know, we were getting ready to leave on our big summer vacation. We're just back, you know, by the way. And we had a great time for everybody out there who's wondering, who's concerned, who was wishing us the best. Had a great time. We're just back. And anyway, yeah, I was getting ready to leave, and I went to the crawl space to retrieve our luggage, our suitcases, a couple of little ratty bags that we carry around. And as I stood at the little opening to that place of darkness and despair, I could almost hear, you know, in the distance, the Indiana Jones music starting up. You know, dun-dun-dun-dun, that music. Yeah, because going into my crawl space, it pretty much is just like being Indiana Jones. You get to crawl through spider webs and bug carcasses and other assorted filth. Uh, unfortunately, instead of emerging with a weird little fat, you know, golden statue, you come out with a sore back and a couple of dumpy suitcases. But still, you kind of feel like Indiana Jones. So anyway, I'm stealing myself up for that experience, and then I jumped in to the darkness. And I had a flashlight in my mouth, and I started crawling. I advanced maybe two feet or so, then I hit my head you know, on a floor joist, and then I crawled two more feet, and I ripped my shirt on the pointy corner of a low-hanging duct. But eventually, bruised and beaten, I reached the suitcases, dragged them back through the filth, and then fed them through the little opening into my main basement. And I crawled out, exhausted but triumphant, and when I stood up, I dusted the spider webs off the front of my shirt and the front of my shorts, and then I went about the rest of my business for the day. You know, we were going on vacation, after all, and that meant I had stores to go to, you know, supplies to get, things like that, errands to run. So I did all of that. I went here, I went there, I bought this, I bought that. I interacted with people. That's the big thing here. I asked where things are. I was charming. I was personable. I was funny. I was witty. I was going on vacation, and so I was a social butterfly. Finally, I got done with all of that, got all my stuff, and I headed home. I began hauling, you know, all of these things in, and then one of the kids who came up to help you know, help me with the bags, stops me and says, hey, what's on your shoulder? And then he goes and pulls off the spiderwebbed, emaciated carcass of a dead moth that was as big as a mouse, pulls that off my shoulder. Great. All through all of those stores, all of my social interactions, all of that, did it all with a spiderwebbed moth the size of a mouse on my shoulder. So I'm thinking about that. Then I hear another kid say, hey, dad, hold still. There's something on your back. He then begins to brush off five, six other dead creatures, bugs, big bugs. I don't know. Then another kid comes in and tells me to brush off my own shorts. They're not going to do that for me. Brush off the back of my shorts because I'm covered with stuff there. So I do that. And lo and behold, 10, 20, I don't know, assorted dead things fall onto the ground. Well, I'm just standing there in the midst of this huge pile of dead bugs and filth. And before I can say anything witty or even slightly funny, the kids move in on me from all directions and start picking over me like we're all part of some herd or pack. And they're grooming me. The final straw, the final straw in this whole thing was when somebody pulled this long, enormous, intact spider web full of dead flies out of my hair. It was like a you know Christmas tree garland without without any of the festivity. I was literally covered with filth everywhere except the front of my shirt and shorts, which I had brushed off. I had blind spots, big time blind spots, and they were really, really embarrassing. All right, now let's get to the paint point. A lot of us have blind spots just like this. Well, not just like this. Those were pretty extreme. But a lot of us have blind spots in our homes. You know, sometimes these places are areas that we don't often go to or look at very closely. You know, maybe that's what's going on. Sometimes they're things that we see or experience daily, but because we've become so accustomed to them, we're blind to them. For example, my bathroom. And this is embarrassing. I mean, this whole segment is embarrassing. 
pretty much the entire Repcolite Home Improvement Show is one big, long, embarrassing experience for me. But anyway, this is one of those really embarrassing things. My bathroom. Um, I started redoing it a while ago. You know, I removed the baseboard. I ripped out the existing floor and the super old, super small, you know, almost child-sized toilet. And I installed new flooring and a new normal-sized toilet so that when I sit there, my legs swing in the air. You know, I got all of that done. I was cooking. I was nailing it. I was doing, I was doing serious, serious, impressive work. But, 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 are you ready for this? That's where I quit. And that, that may not sound embarrassing, but you know, you, you want to know the rest of the story? I quit at that stage. You know, the trim is off, the baseboard's off, not, nothing's been repainted. Basically, I just got the floor and the toilet done. I quit uh, basically when Betsy was still on the radio show with me. Think about that. How long has it been since you heard Betsy? Betsy predated Haley. So we're talking several years ago. My bathroom has been in that unfinished state for all of those years, and I don't even see it anymore. It's just my bathroom, you know? Somebody helped us out with the dogs while we were on vacation, and that's why I'm thinking about this. They asked me about the bathroom when we got back. You know, they were curious. What, what are we going to do in there? We see you're working in the bathroom. What are you doing? That's when I realized, you know, I didn't know how to explain to them that I'd been doing this for four years or more. You know, finally, I saw it and I realized, wow, I have left that undone. I've been blind to it. I've got to get it finished. And I was blind to it because I live in it. You know, I'm sure I would see it from time to time. I'm sure there were times where I would look at it and realize, oh, man, I got to get going on that. But it never startled or surprised me because I see it day in and day out in that condition. So that's what I'm talking about. Blind spots. Do you have any unfair? finished projects around your house, anything like that. I would be surprised if it's that extreme, but who knows? Maybe you do. Or here's another shocker that hit me because of our time away. I came home and was stunned to find that my house stinks. It stinks like an old house. You know that smell, right? I, I don't mean a nostalgic um, feel-good smell. It's kind of, you know, the smell that makes you want to open a window and light a candle. I was shocked. You know, my time away from the house demonstrated how nose blind I was. When you live in a den of filth, I guess it just smells like home. But when you go somewhere where the smell isn't and then come back, well, it hits you right between the eyes. Do you have any of that going on in your home? Do you notice anything smell-wise, you know, when you come home from work? Maybe, maybe have a guest over, somebody who will be utterly gentle with you, and then ask them, hey, do you notice any, anything aroma-wise? in the house here. Anything? You know, ask about it. How about other blind spots? You know, our garages. They're often a second entrance to our homes. You know, lots of us have garage entries that our guests use on a regular basis. Well, if that's the case for your home, what does your garage look like? Does it look the way you want an entry to your home to look like? Or do you not even think about the garage as an entry? It's just the garage. Is it a blind spot? Well, what about your front doors? This is another common blind spot. You know, if you enter your home through the garage, if that's how you get into your house most often, well, there's a good chance you rarely use your main front door. And when that's the case, most of us pay very little attention to that area, you know, the front doors of our homes. However, most visitors to our home who aren't family or really close friends, they usually do head to the front doors. Well, what are they finding? How about clutter? You know, what about dings and scuff marks on your walls that should be touched up but haven't been? Blind spots. They're all blind spots. You know, I could go on and on. Uh, we've probably all got them, you know, some of them for sure. And today we're going to spend this whole show talking about how to fix them. And we'll be talking about sprucing up our front entrances at the end of the show. We're going to focus on that. Before that, we're going to be going through some cleaning and organizing resources for our garages. And coming up next, I'm going to dish out the second to last George job for the summer dealing with house smells. But before we get to all of that, there is a nagging question that I kind of want to deal with. You know, I'm anticipating uh, this as a rebuttal, you know, to everything I just said about blind spots. Um, I think the fair rebuttal to everything that I just said would be this. We the people living in the house, you know, we don't see these things. They're blind spots. So what does it matter? You know, why should I worry so much about making my house acceptable to the guests that I may or may not have over? If it doesn't bother me, why should this be a big deal? All right. I think 
Um, that's a fair, uh, you know, it's a fair question. It's a, f- it's a fair rebuttal. I've got a couple of reasons why I think that it's worth doing. The first one is that when you do have guests over, you will notice these areas. You know, it's just going to happen. But by then, it's usually too late to do anything about them. And it's just embarrassing. You know, when I have people over and they see my unfinished bathroom, I can't fix it at that point. I'll wish I had noticed it or thought about it ahead of time. And I'll wish I had fixed it because that's pretty tough to live down when you kind of do a home improvement radio show and you haven't finished your bathroom. So it's embarrassing. That's one reason. A second reason is that I really completely believe that even if we don't consciously see these areas in our home, they still subconsciously affect us in a negative manner. You know, it's not that tough to believe that my subconscious mind is aware of the unfinished bathroom, even though I don't regularly notice it or see it. And I'm certain that that weighs on me. Or clutter. You know, think about clutter. Clutter can lead to stress and anxiety, and I know I don't have to acknowledge it or name it as clutter for it to have that effect. You know, clutter by any other name, it's still clutter. It's still going to do what clutter does. So these blind spots, they're worth finding and they're worth fixing. And with that in mind, let's take a break, and then when we come back, we'll tackle a blind spot that we all may have, house smells. That's just ahead. Stick around. Well, my name's Dan. Hi, everybody. Um, I've got a stinky house, and I didn't realize it till I came back home from a week away. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, and I cannot be the only person dealing with this stinky house issue, right? This embarrassing stinky house issue. I know I'm not. Maybe you're dealing with it, too. Maybe you just don't know it. Maybe you're nose blind like I was. Well, for those of us who are in this little old house stink recovery group, let's figure out what we can do to eliminate the stink and freshen up our abode. And this is actually going to be the George job for the week, destinkifying your house. And if you don't know what a George job is, well, at this point, you just have to go back some episodes, you know, check out the past few episodes, and I'll explain it there. I explain it ad nauseum. You'll get everything you need to know. The short version is that George jobs are just small projects that you can tackle that will kind of help you gain some control and some momentum around the house. So let's get to it. Destinkifying your house. The first thing that I've got when it comes to this topic is a caveat. The smells in an old home can really be due to all kinds of things. We gotta throw that out there right from the get go. You know, for example, bathrooms can smell because the wax sealer on the toilet is in need of replacement. Water leaks throughout the years can make wood smell even if there wasn't any mold. Sometimes floors get installed over old floors. You know, think linoleum or something like that. It's definitely possible that that old floor or the backing of that older floor contains some odors that then permeate and fill the house. And on and on and on. There are a lot of big reasons for the stink sometimes. And some of those can be things that are tricky or expensive to solve. But let's look at some basic places to start if you're dealing with some house stink and some of the things that you can do. So first thing you need to do is look for moisture issues, right? Moisture problems in a home lead to mold and mildew, and they'll definitely contribute to a smell. So check toilets, tubs, showers, check your washer, check your sinks, all of these things. Look them over for leaks. Make sure your roof isn't leaking. Make sure you're not getting water seeping through the walls into your basement. You know, is the grade of the ground sloping away from your home, from your foundation walls? Are your gutters cleaned out? You know, are they channeling water away from the home? Make sure everything is leak-free as best you can and mold-free. That's a really good place to start. Now, for me, when I did that, I didn't notice, you know, any sign of significant moisture or mold or mildew. But I did notice that my crawl space has a slight musty smell. And that really just adds to, you know, the ambiance down in that already wonderful part of the home. But the problem is that smell, that musty smell, means there is a moisture issue going on in some regard. Now, for me, I'm not seeing any signs of water seeping in, but the space is humid. And that turns out to be a really common thing. But unfortunately, common or not, you don't want it. Humidity in the air, in the crawl space, or pretty much anywhere, but in the crawl space, can cause all kinds of issues down the road. And it can certainly 
uh, contribute to house smells. So I noticed this, and I started running a dehumidifier in that space. It's not terribly convenient, but it definitely reduced the humidity and the smell very quickly. So that's the second recommendation. Run a dehumidifier. You know, your air conditioner is probably taking care of this throughout the bulk of the home. But for me, a dehumidifier in the crawl space and the basement definitely made a big improvement. So consider those things. Another thing to do, super crazy simple, uh, open the windows and let the sun in. And it, it's really, it's a no-brainer. Uh, but maybe the air in the home that, you, you know, the stink that you're dealing with, maybe it's just stale air. You know, so air out the space using fans and see what happens. You know, I did that right away. And, of course, there were near instant results. Um, I also made sure to open the blinds and let the sun in because the UV light from the sun actually kills the bacteria that can contribute to the smells. So open those blinds, let the sun in. Another thing you can do, you can wash the walls down. Now, walls actually can trap all kinds of smells, especially kitchen walls with all the cooking that we do. So wash those areas down with an odor-killing cleaner. Odoban is one example. I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, When you look it up on Amazon, it's kind of great. It clearly says right there in the description that it eliminates unpleasant stenches. Mm -hmm. Unpleasant stenches. Do you really need the adjective unpleasant when you're using the noun stenches? I don't know. Anyway, consider a product like that. Another recommendation out there on the World Wide Web is a home remedy that I haven't tried yet, but makes a lot of sense. It's basically just taking a small amount of baking soda and mixing it in water and washing the walls down with that. So mix about a half a cup of baking soda in a half a gallon or so of water and then stir it and stir it and stir it till the water's clear. Then you wipe the walls down and then come back later and rinse the walls well a second time with clean water. Now, if you're going to go through all that work and you're going to wash those walls down, it's always wise. It's critical to test your cleaning solution, even if it's just the baking soda and water, in a few out-of-the-way spots. You know, if you've got a flat finish or even a lower-end, you know, lower-quality matte finish, there really could be issues. Uh, You might not want to try this step. However, if you've got good quality paint in a matte finish and higher, it really should be fine. But still, do that testing first. Now, another thing that you could try if if you decide you're not going to go that route, you know, a new paint job will make a huge difference. You know, nothing really will make a space feel as fresh and clean as a new coat of paint on the walls. So that's definitely something to consider. Uh, What about carpets? Well, there are a lot of different things you could try to get smells out of carpet, but the go-to is really simple. It's baking soda. You just sprinkle it on, let it sit for a little while, and then vacuum it right up. Now, there are scented versions of baking soda for carpets, you know, specifically for carpets, and I've used them, and all I'll say here is that you better not be smell sensitive if you're going to go down that road. Uh, The one I used was overpowering, and from here on out, I'm going to stick to the unscented varieties. Just saying. Another thing you can try are air purifiers, you know, natural or otherwise. There are activated charcoal bags that you can buy relatively inexpensively, and you basically just hang them up out of sight in your crawl spaces, tuck them in a cupboard, wherever, and they'll just naturally absorb odors. Baking soda does the same thing. Pop a box of baking soda open and put that around the house, you know, kind of tuck it away. Uh, You could also invest in a literal air purifier. That will help. Um, What about pet smells? Well, pet smells, pretty tricky to deal with. I've got two dogs, so I should know. Uh, I'm sure they're contributors to the house smell, but a number of things that you can try to do. First off, grooming, regular grooming. Make sure you stay up on that. Keep grooming the pets. That's first. Um, Also, make sure you're cleaning off any of the soft furniture or the areas where they hang out, where they spend their time. Uh, It's not easy to deal with dog smells. Maybe we'll have to focus on that on another segment, you know, when I've got more time. We'll do that in the future. Um, A final idea before we wrap this up would be to really just, you know, give your house a really efficient deep cleaning. Get in the cupboards, wash down the baseboards, get behind the fridge, all of that. You know, it's not fun. I get it. But if it removes the stink... Well, it feels like a win in my book. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're tackling garages. That's all next. Stick around. And we're back. You're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show. And today, it's all about blind spots. And right now, we're going to take a look at garages. And I think it's safe to say, I think it's safe to say that most of us probably have a blind spot regarding our garage. You know, after all, they're just garages, right? 
Well, it's true, they're just garages, but often, as we discussed and mentioned in the very first segment, a lot of us have visitors entering our homes through our garages, you know, close friends and family members anyway. And even if that's not the case, uh, even if you never have guests enter your home through your garage, chances are you probably do. And if your garage is messy, disorganized, dirty, or whatever, you know, you're not, you're really not starting your time at home off on the best foot. You know, when I come home from work and I trip over a pile of rakes on my way into the house, well, really, the evening's not off to the very best start. And But even if that doesn't happen, even if I, you know, walk through and miss all of the rakes, I'm still walking through disorganization and mess. And even if I'm not fully soaking all of that in consciously, I really still believe it's negatively impacting how I feel about about the space overall. And I think that happens to all of us. So let's get our garages organized. And yeah, how are we going to do that on the radio? You know, every garage is different. And I kind of went back and forth trying to figure out how to do this one. And what I decided to do was I'm just going to focus on some key concepts, you know, that are connected to organization. And then I'm going to talk about a bunch of resources and paint stuff that you might need to know. And hopefully some of it's going to help you. It's going to be a hodgepodge. It's like a big buffet. You know, it's not going to have a start and a finish that's clearly defined. Um, Hopefully you'll get something out of this. We'll see how it goes. Anyway, first off, very first thing you need to do, before you can address any issue in the garage, you've got to do the very first step. And that's to assess and identify you know, the the problem, the problem that you're dealing with. So it's early in the morning. You've got your cup of coffee. Take that cup of coffee out to your garage and fling the garage door open and then just stand there soaking it all in. Your goal here is to identify the problem areas. Now, it sounds stupid. I know that. It sounds really, really basic. And it is, but it's going to help. You need to figure out the pressure points that you're dealing with. Now, for me, I bought a ton of yard tools at a garage sale this summer. You know, two bucks per item. Couldn't go wrong. So I bought tons of rakes and shovels and edgers as much as my little stubby arms could carry. I grabbed them and snatched them up. It was a great deal. But, you know, I don't have any place at home to put them right now. Not in my garage. Not in my system. So they ended up being scattered all over, all throughout the garage. Uh, it's a pressure point. I've got to fix that. Shoes and boots, they're another pressure point in my garage. I've got five kids. You can imagine the shoes that collect with all of those kids. You know, which shoes still fit? Uh, Which shoes are even pairs anymore? Who knows? I've got no idea. Oh, the shoes have a place where they're supposed to go, but right now that's not being used very effectively for a number of reasons. That's a pressure point. I've got to get that fixed. Those are my examples. When I fix those things, this is really interesting to me. When I fix those things and really look at the situation, I'm going to have eliminated almost 70% of my garage problem. You know, I look at the garage and think, wow, it's disorganized. It's crazy. It's a mess. Nope. When I really sit down and analyze it, it's just a couple of things that are causing the problem. The rest of it's not as bad as I might think. So, Do this for yourself. Take a few minutes. Identify the pressure points. What are they? You know, do you have too many pieces of yard equipment that don't run? Do you have sports stuff that's taken over, you know, most of the garage? That happens a lot. If you've got kids, you've got sports stuff, and it takes stuff over. You know, maybe for you it's fishing or camping gear. Maybe it's just a bunch of stuff, stuff, random stuff, that you hauled to the garage for one reason or another and then just ended up leaving it there. You know, find your pressure points, whatever they are, and then start making your plan. And there are 8 million, there's there's just millions and millions of storage solutions out there. There's answers on the internet for everything. You know, and and in fact, this this is why this is a hard topic to talk about. It, It feels like throwaway info, but I'm hoping that by talking about it, I'll inspire at least some people to go out there and take a look. But go out there and Google you know, what you need for the pressure points you've identified. You know, when I Google yard tool racks, for example, thousands of interesting plans and products, of course, come up. It's Google. That's how it works. They want to sell me stuff. They want to show me stuff. I get all kinds of systems that I find that I could buy, that I could build. Maybe I Google fishing rods. I I Googled fishing rods. There's no maybe about it. I Googled fishing rods. And do that, and you're going to find a ton of interesting, really creative solutions that might be just what you need. 
Google shoe storage, sports gear storage, tool storage. If you don't have a plan or a system for the things that are causing your problems, do that research. The internet is there waiting to help you. Google is your friend in this regard. Now, find the systems that are going to work for you and then build them, buy them, whatever you need to do. And when you're doing all of that, you know, making your plans, getting your ideas, starting to gather supplies, maybe buying some stuff, here are four things to keep in mind to make sure that your organizational system functions as well as possible for as long as possible. First off, make it easy to understand. You know, everybody should see at a glance how your system is going to work and what goes there. Don't create, for example, and I speak from experience here, don't create a storage system for various balls and then divide them all up by sports. You know, it sounds really good, but I had enough people in my family who didn't appreciate the difference uh, between a softball and a baseball. They couldn't see exactly what the, what the issue was here or why a baseball is different from a wiffle ball or whatever. You know, to me, it's obvious to them. It was too complicated and the system broke immediately. So make sure your system's easy to understand. Make it simple to use. You know, if you want the system to be used, make sure that the people in your family who are supposed to be using it can use it. You know, super simple stuff here. I almost want to apologize for what I'm delivering because it just feels that ridiculous. But maybe there's somebody out there going, oh, make it simple to use. Huh. That makes sense. I like what this guy's saying. Anyway, third thing, create a system with room for growth. Now, if you want the system to work, it's got to be able to grow with you. You know, I had all my yard tools hung on the wall, and it worked, and it was literally beautiful. It was a, it was a piece of art. It was like a Tetris layout. Uh, everything had a place. And then I bought a boatload of new stuff, and suddenly there's nowhere to go with it. My brilliant system completely ridiculous. It was landlocked. So opt for storage systems with room to grow. Racks for my rakes and shovels, for example. They may not give off that same super cool vibe that a wall of tools does, but with a rack, I can double and triple stack tools and accommodate new stuff as I bring it in. So make sure you have that room for growth. Conversely, the last point, be cautious of too much storage. You know, too much storage can be a problem. You know, you need to have enough, but too much that can really cramp you, too, because if you buy, let's say, 20 totes or you create rows and rows of shelves beyond what you've got stuff for, well, there's a strong likelihood that you're going to save and store more things than you really need or want. You know, if the space is a little bit limited, you've got to have enough. You know, you've got to find that butter zone. You've got to have enough and a little bit of room to grow. But if the space is a little more dear to you, if the real estate is prime real estate, you're not going to save every single thing out there. You're going to be a little more judicious with what you keep and what you toss. So make sure you don't give yourself an overabundance of storage, but do make sure that you've got room to grow. All right? Basic stuff, but keeping it in mind will help you as you organize. All right. That's organization. What about other problems in the garage? And I guess... In this instance, I'm thinking about something that impacted me, you know, big items that maybe don't work anymore or, you know, stuff that you just don't want or need. Grills, exercise equipment, lawnmowers, snowblowers, you know, things like that. That stuff can take up a huge amount of space and it's not easy to get rid of. You know, even, even if you find a place where you can bring it, a place that will accept it, you've still got to get it there. You've got to load it. And who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. I'll tell you that right now. Well, if you're in that boat, get a junk hauler. You know, I did this a few months ago. We talked about it on the show. I called 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And every time I say that, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I feel like I'm doing a commercial. But it was great. I called them early in the morning, and within about two hours, there were two guys there with a big truck. And they gave me an estimate after they saw everything that I wanted to get rid of. And then, yeah, like two hours later, all of that stuff is gone. And I'm just standing in my garage looking at floor space that I didn't even know I had. So think about that. If you're dealing with those big ticket items, those big items, get a junk hauler out there. 1-800-GOT-JUNK is one, but there are other ones. Uh, another problem that people run into are the chemicals and the fertilizers and the solvents that collect in the garage. You know, dirty oil from oil changes, insecticides, all of that stuff. What do you do with that? Well, there are hazardous household waste facilities in all of our listening areas that will accept those items, usually usually at no charge. Uh, some of them will even take back old TVs and other items like that for a charge. So go online, Google it, you know, search for household hazardous waste near me, collection sites near me, 
and you'll find plenty of places. You'll get all the information, the hours that they're there, and all of the details. But there are places to bring even those things that we look at and think, I have no idea how to safely and responsibly get rid of this stuff. There are solutions out there. All right. Another thing I want to talk about, because I know it's a garage issue, oil stains on the concrete. And there are a number of ways to fix this and clean it up. Uh, We talked about it on the show probably about a year ago or so. Haley did this with her garage, and she used a product called ACT. ACT concrete cleaner and basically I'll I'll link to the the episode in the show notes if you want to check that out and get the full details but uh, basically it's just a powder you sprinkle it on the floor kind of work it in with a push broom mist it with water let it sit for a while and then eventually you just rinse it all away again I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to check that out that's act concrete cleaner we don't carry it at Repcolite but you can order it online. Uh, you know, just look that up. A product that we do carry that works pretty well to do the same thing is TSP, trisodium phosphate. Uh, basically, you just make a paste using TSP. It's a powder, and you add a little bit of water to it, make this paste, and you apply it to the stain. Let it sit until the TSP is dry. It's probably going to take, I don't know, 20, 24 hours, something like that, and then sweep it away. Most of the time, that's going to remove you know, quite a bit of that stain. Uh, if you do need to, you can always reapply. You know, do it all again. All right, last thing that I've got. You know, getting, getting everything organized in the garage is one thing, but you, you've got to give attention to the walls. That, that's a big part of, of you know, determining how that space feels. And for you, you know, your situation, everybody's situation is a little different. Maybe for you, it's just removing spider webs and other stuff like that from the walls. Maybe that's good enough. Maybe the walls were painted once, but they're all dinged up and they're marked up after years of use. Uh, don't leave them that way. Touch up the dings, patch the holes, do a quick repaint. There's nothing like a hole in the wall to really drag down the look. You know, even if it's just a door that swung open and the handle went through the drywall, there's ways to fix that. There's little tricks to that to make that patch pretty easy. You can pull that off. I don't have time to talk about it here, but ask about it in the store. Get that patched, get those walls painted, make the space feel a ton better. If your walls were drywalled before but never primed or painted, maybe it's time to get them painted. You know, pick a color and you'll be surprised how much better Everything feels in that space. And really, you don't need to drop a ton of cash on paint for the garage if you don't want to. You can use standard interior paint. You don't need to use an exterior product. A lot of people think since it's the inside of the garage and who knows what what it might be exposed to, they think they need an exterior product. You don't. It's not recommended at all. Put an interior product on those walls. So even if you've got paint left over in the basement, from other work that you've done in the house, that paint is suitable for the garage. If you do need to buy new stuff, like I said, you don't have to buy top-of-the-line, super primo expensive stuff. At Repcolite, we've got paint that's going to really fit any budget. You know, We can go all over the place, all the way up to the primo and all the way down to stuff that's going to be perfect for your garage without costing you an arm and a leg. So just make sure you're getting the right finish, probably an eggshell in the garage, and you'll be great. Stop out at the store, tell us what you're working on, and we'll make some recommendations. If you do want to go top of the line, if you do want to go nuts, and you really want something that's going to last and last, last thing I'll say, I'd recommend ScuffX from Benjamin Moore. It's pricier right off the bat, but since it resists scuffs so well, your walls are going to still be looking great years and years down the road. And if you've got a wall of tools, if that's how you hang up your tools, your rakes and stuff like that, I'd really think about, even if you just paint that one wall with ScuffX, ScuffX is going to be super for that wall. It's going to hold up to what you throw at it. All right, that's enough for this topic. I know it was all over the board. Hopefully you got something out of it that helped you with your situation. Let's take a break right now. When we come back, we'll turn our eye to one last blind spot around our homes, our front entrances. That's all coming up in just a minute. Stick around. Well, here we are again, working our way through pounds and pounds of Radio Gold. Radio Gold, you're listening to the Repco Light Home Improvement Show, sponsored by Benjamin Moore. And I almost said pounds and pounds of Radio Fudge. Uh, Not because that makes any sense, but because fudge is actually on my mind. I told you earlier uh, at the beginning of the show that we went on vacation last week, and one of the places that we visited was Mackinac Island. And, of course, when you're there, you absolutely need to buy fudge. It's just how it works. And so we did that. 
And we bought an unreasonable amount of fudge. I think we bought five pounds. Five pounds of fudge. That's a lot of fudge. Well, we brought home about one and a half pounds of fudge. But before we could eat it on our very last day of vacation last week, Sunday, our dumb black lab found it. She ripped open the box, ate all of the fudge that was left over, plastic wrappers and everything. Yeah, not good, not good at all. It's not good for dogs, none of it. The fudge, the plastic, it's not healthy for the dog to eat the fudge, to eat my fudge. That's bad. You don't want to do that. Anyway, thankfully, we found out right away, took her to the emergency vet, and, you know, ka-ching, 1500 bucks later, she's doing great, living the dream. But I still don't have any fudge. Nothing edible anyway. What a way to end vacation. Gotta love that. Anyway, I don't know how I got on all of that, but let's wrap up the show with a quick look at the last blind spot around our homes that I wanted to focus on, our front entrances. And here's my pitch. You know, we've hit the end of summer for the most part, and that means fall and winter, and the holidays are coming. You know, with the holidays far away. They're still far away. But that still means there's the potential that we're all going to have lots of guests at our home in the next few months. Well, if that's the case, let's make sure our front entrance is looking great, and let's do it while the weather's nice. So check out your front entrance today sometime. Give it a good cleaning if you've got time. Clean off the spider webs, and who knows what else is going on out there. You're probably going to have to do it again in the fall, but you really, you never go wrong with a little cleaning. So do that, then take a look at what else is going on out there. You know, how's your welcome mat if you have one? Is it welcoming or is it threadbare and and pretty gross? Well, make it nice, you know, do that. What about the light fixtures? I've got two old sconces, you know, right by my front door and they really need to be changed. They're dated and new ones would really add a lot to that part of the house. So check out your situation in regards to your light fixtures. What about new hardware on the door? That's another relatively simple step. Uh, There is some expense to that, but super simple to do, and it really makes a huge difference. You know, hardware makes a way bigger impact than we often initially think. I put new knobs and pulls on my kitchen cabinets years ago, and they almost looked brand new when I was done. The cabinets did. Almost looked brand new when I was done. Try it with your front door. It can have a huge payoff. What about painting the front door? That's the simplest way there is to really impact that front entrance. And right now, the weather's perfect for that kind of a project. All you need is a quart of paint, a few supplies, and then probably a total of four hours to do the work. Um, We've talked about it on the show a hundred times, but I'll walk you through the project just because I'll just lay it out, show you how simple it is. All you need to do, you start by cleaning the door with TSP or Dawn dish soap. Just get contaminants off of the surface. So do that, TSP, Dawn dish soap, wash it down. Then when it's dry, do a light scuff sanding, probably a 180 to a 220 grit paper. You're not taking the finish off here. You're just dulling it down, you know, providing an anchor profile for your next coat. Once that's done, wipe the door clean with a damp rag. If there are any peeling spots at that point, if you've got a steel door with peeling spots, scrape everything loose around that spot off. Get all of the loose stuff off and then spot prime with a rust inhibitive primer for every area where you're down to to bare metal. Once you've got all of that done, it's time for painting. Don't need to prime it or do anything like that. You want to paint midday and then you can leave that door open until evening and then you should be able to close it without any issue. You know, it's not going to stick or anything like that. Uh, for paint, we'd recommend Benjamin Moore's More Life, More Guard, More Glow, any of those options, Command, Endura from Repcolite, all of those are great. Soft gloss, satin sheen, semi-gloss, those finishes, you'll have great results with something like that. Finally, if you're going to go through all that work, you might want to consider painting the inside of that entry door as well. Uh, If you're going to do that, consider a color other than the color of your trim or walls if you really want to make a big impact. Uh, Just make sure that you're using an interior grade paint for the inside of the door. Don't use the same exterior paint that you used on the exterior side of the door. It's not good to use that stuff inside. All right, if you happen to just have a wood door, we've got exterior varnishes that can be applied as maintenance coats if you just need to get a new coat on uh, to keep it looking good. Or if your door needs a little more TLC than that, you can always sand it down and restain it and then apply a couple of coats of a new finish. We're happy to help with all of that. Just swing out to any Repcolite. Tell us what you're working on. We'll answer your questions and we'll get you what you need. All right, there you go, the blind spot episode. Hopefully, you found something in there that will help you around your home. If you did, shoot me an email at radio at repcolite.com. I'd like to hear your comments. And, yeah, anything else you're working on, too. Let me know what you got cooking. And, yeah, it's always fun to, to be connected 
uh, to the people out there listening. All right, whatever you do today, make sure paint's a part of it. Have a great weekend, everybody, and I'll see you next week. I'm Dan Hansen. Thanks for listening. Thank you.